The aim of this presentation is to help educational suppliers prepare for Brexit. By the end of the webinar, I want you to be informed as possible and know the actions you need to take to protect your business. Over the next hour, I'll be outlining the major economic, regulatory and compliance issues educational suppliers can expect to face. I'll be talking you through how the movement of goods, services and data will be affected by Brexit. That will take about 35 minutes. In the final section, I'll run you through the 10 recommendations that BISA is making to the Department for International Trade. These recommendations are to help the Department for International Trade negotiate terms that will benefit all educational suppliers in future trade and services agreements with the rest of the world. In short, the information I'm about to give you is highly important. The first thing I'd like to do, however, is to quickly take stock of where we are in the Brexit process. After a huge government communications campaign this month, which has told us all to get ready for Brexit, this might feel a little bit underwhelming because we now know that Britain will not be leaving the European Union on October the 31st. On Tuesday, on the evening of Tuesday the 28th of October, the leaders of the European Council, that is the leaders of the other 27 EU member states, agreed that Britain would be granted an extension to stay within the EU to 11 o'clock GMT on the 31st of January 2020. During this time, it is hoped that Britain will pass Boris Johnson's newly negotiated withdrawal agreement. If this is passed, and it looks likely, this would mean that Britain would enjoy a transition period whereby it would stay within the EU customs union and single market until 11 o'clock GMT on the 31st of December 2020. So you've seen there are two chronologies at play now, two timelines. First of all, Britain, whatever happens, even if Boris Johnson's deal isn't passed, will now stay in the European Union to the 31st of January at a minimum. If Boris Johnson's deal is passed, Britain will stay in key institutions of the European Union, such as the customs union and the single market until the 31st of December, 2020. If the timescale has changed, however, the key takeaway message that I want to emphasize today to you is that the substance of the preparations you need to take really hasn't. In either eventuality, whether we leave on the 31st of January, 2020, or whether we leave on the 1st of January 2021, the outcome really is going to be very similar in all probability to no deal. This is because, as I'll explain, the key outcome of a no deal outcome would be that Britain would leave the EU customs union and single market. Those are the key business risks, and those would be the same risks regardless of whether we leave with a deal, without a deal now because Boris Johnson's agreement has specifically suggested that we'll move more towards a hard Brexit outcome. First of all, I want, you, I want to say welcome and to say that the struggles that your business face when it comes to preparedness or maybe lack of information you might have are, are not that unusual. 87% of UK businesses admit to possessing incomplete information or contingency plans concerning a no-deal Brexit, and four out of 10 small and medium-sized enterprises report having no contingency plans whatsoever. Responding to a BISA survey in 2016, over 92% of educational suppliers called on the government to, to clearly communicate to businesses the challenges that lie ahead. Unfortunately, over the last two years, these calls have mostly gone unanswered. A few months ago, the Prime Minister committed an extra £2.1 billion for no deal preparations. These additional funds were announced just 93 days before the October, well, the then October the 31st deadlines. And so time for all businesses has been a major constraint to no deal planning. This presentation has been funded in part by money that's been given by the 
uh, Department for Business and Energy and Industrial Strategies Business Readiness Fund, which are providing money to trade associations like Visa to help educational suppliers prepare for Brexit. The key advantage we have now, though, is that if time was previously an even bigger time constraint, with the extension with the extension to January the 31st, or even possibly the transition period until the 31st of December 2020, we have now have a lot more time to get our businesses ready. There is still a lot business can, there is still a lot businesses can do, no matter how last minute everything may be. There are a number of immediate measures that educational suppliers can take to protect their position, which is why I have put this webinar together. In a moment, I'll talk you through the changes that are going to happen to the movement of goods. But, but before I do that, I want to quickly cover the Brexit basics. It's important to know them before we cover the other topics. If no deal is reached between the EU and the UK, Britain will cease to be a member of the European Union at 11 p.m. on the 31st of January, and no longer October, the 31st of January 2020. It will exit both the EU single market and the customs union, as well as arrangements, pacts and treaties that have lasted for over 40 years. For educational suppliers, this means trade will no longer be governed by the EU treaties or case law. Instead, it will either be governed by the World Trade Organization's General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, or GATT for short, or by its General Agreement on Trade and Services, GATS. One of the biggest consequences of this change is that UK businesses that trade goods or services into the EU will pay tariffs for the first time in 46 years. We'll be looking at some of the tariffs educational suppliers may face in more detail shortly. The second big change that I'd like to emphasize is that the market access of educational suppliers to certain EU markets may change. When we were part of the EU, we benefited from the free movement of services, people, capital, uh, and data. And this meant that educational suppliers in Britain could freely trade with all of the 20, other 27 EU member states and freely sell to their primary, secondary, uh, university and adult education sectors. After Brexit, after Britain leaves the EU, our ability to access EU markets will no longer be governed by EU rules. It'll instead be governed by the WTO rules. Now, under the WTO rules, each EU country, each of the other 27 EU member states, gets to specify how much market access or how much uh, openness in business it wants to provide to certain categories of provider or services. And for education, crucially, only 22 of the 27 EU member states, apart from the UK, have agreed to allow UK, edu UK educational suppliers to have continued access. There are five key markets which suggest that they're going to put some restrictions on the ability of UK educational suppliers to sell to either their primary or secondary schools. And to list them off the top of my head, which I may not be able to do, these include countries um, including S Slovakia, Slovenia, Cyprus, Malta and Finland. There you go. Slovakia, Slovenia, Cyprus, Malta and Finland have all suggested that they'll now place restrictions on the market access of UK suppliers. And as I said, under the WTO rules, the UK will now be subject to import tariffs and export tariffs. Now, to know what terms, to know what tariff terms your businesses will face, you will need to work out, first of all, if your offering, your trade offering, is a good or a service. Now, you might be thinking that this is evident, that you know if your offering is a good or a service. 
but it's not always as straightforward as it seems. Sometimes what initially appears as a service, such as delivering lesson content to children in foreign schools, actually takes the form of a conveyance or transmission of goods, as in when you send books or software abroad. How could we classify such a transaction? Would it be a good or a service? Well, let's go back to basics. There are no formal definitions, but the WTO tends to opt for this distinction. All, all material products are classed as goods, but if the product is related so to some activity, they are treated as services. So all material products are classed as goods, but if the material product is related to some activity, they are treated as services. Okay, what in the name of earth does that mean? So a textbook is a good. But when a supplier's activity concerns the distribution of a textbook, it is classed as a service. So you see here that the distribution of the good is an activity, and so that activity is considered to be a service. Software is also commonly considered to be a good, but when your contract is for the licensing of software, then it is a service. And that's why when people give uh, sell service, sell software, it usually is considered services because you're not actually giving them property over your software, you're licensing them your software. In the example just given, a contract for textbooks or software would fall under the provision of goods. As I said, that's if you were selling all of the software rather than just providing a license. However, if the contract provided that you also had to distribute the books, or if you were licensing the software, as 99% of their tech companies would be, that would be a service. That said, there's also now a third product. There's also now a third category between goods and services. This is because in the modern age, for an increasing range of products, trying to draw neat distinctions between goods and services is pointless. For example, a lot of edtech products straddle the line between goods and services, with services such as built-in digital technologies integrated into goods. The example I'd like to give you here is the Nintendo Game Boy example. When I was working uh, as a junior lawyer in the European Court of Justice, I one day had to look at a case which involved the Nintendo Game Boy. And the problem that we had in this case is that when we were looking at sort of the tariff rates that applied to the Game Boy, we didn't really have uh, much to go by. This is because if you think about it, the Nintendo Game Boy, it's a handheld device, a bit like the you know, modern PlayStation portable device, is a piece of hardware. It's a good. It's a solid, something you can hold in your hand like a book. But it's also a, got software, licensed software, which is integrated within it. So like a laptop, it's a piece of hardware with licensed software that is running within it. So it's both at the same time satisfies the definition of a good and satisfies the de definition of a service. These kinds of goods um, have come to be known as a third category, which are sometimes called, now these names are slightly uh, strange, embodied services, servified goods, or most commonly integrated services. Unlike other forms of service, when the final product is exported here, Software providers like edtech companies who sell these sorts of hardware which have built-in technology can expect to face tariffs because when the goods cross the border, they will be taxed, meaning the service element within it is also, by correlation, taxed. So that's the basics covered. Now let's look at how the movement of goods will be affected by a no-deal Brexit. The free movement of goods is one of the four freedoms of EU law, along with the free movement of services, capital and people. It is overseen by the rules and regulations of the EU customs union and the single market. After Brexit, the trade of goods will no longer be governed by the EU, by the EU treaties and case law. Instead, it will be ruled by the WTO's organization, by the World Trade Organization's General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT. So this section is probably most relevant for those educational suppliers amongst you who are 
furniture manufacturers or distributors or textbook publishers, anything, anybody who sells a good, the trade terms that you will govern under will no longer be those of the uh, EU uh, free movement of goods and the institutions that surround that, but rather of the World Trade Organization's general agreement in trade and tariffs. And under GATT, UK businesses trading goods into the EU will pay tariffs for the first time in 46 years. Before, at how we, before we look at how tariffs are calculated or operate under GATT, let's look at how things currently work within the EU customs union and single market to understand what's the difference between how things currently operate and how things will operate in the future. Well, first of all, I'd like to break down what the customs union and single market are because they're some of the most confusing terms associated with Brexit. Let's put it simply, the customs union is really just a free trade area for goods. In it, products circulate freely with no need for customs checks at borders. So if you're sending goods between any of the 20 EU member states, it's a bit like Schengen for goods. You know Schengen where you travel and you don't need to show your passport at a border? Uh, the custom union is like that for goods. You can travel, your, your goods can travel and they don't need to go through customs checks at each of the 20 EU borders. The customs union is therefore considered a free trade area because all EU countries have agreed to abolish tariffs on goods. That means when uh, goods currently cross from Switzerland, perhaps into, sorry, if goods perhaps currently travel from France into Belgium, they will not face any tariff. This is the opposite of what happens when countries trade outside of the EU. So if Belgium traded with uh, Zimbabwe, where there would be a tariff when the uh, border uh, when the uh, good crossed the border. Currently, the customs union means that 49% of the UK's exports to the EU and 53% of its imports are currently done without paying tariffs. When, but the customs union is a bit of a double sword. And this is what we're going to see in terms of the consequences when Britain leaves the EU. The customs union is a free trade area for all the members that exist within it. So if you're part of the club, you get to benefit from it. But for those, for those states, those third parties, those states that are not part of the customs union, they see it a bit as a protectionist area. And what do I mean by protectionist area? Well, the whole point of the customs union is so as to stop European companies, businesses from being undercut by foreign competitors who can exploit cheaper labor or benefit from state subsidies. So you often hear in the news the stories of uh, Chinese or Welsh manufacturers who are complaining about the Chinese steel industry uh, and the fact that it is um, flooding the EU market because it has cheaper products as a result of cheaper labor in China and government subsidies. Well, the whole aim of the customs union is to protect EU businesses from this threat by putting tariffs on all goods coming from outside of the EU, um, imposing tariffs on those goods so that they are not as competitive or they are only as competitive as the, e as the EU goods. So it's a kind of price regulation mechanism, competition regulation mechanism. That means when the UK is outside of the customs union, when it comes to our goods, there will be tariffs that will be imposed on our goods. And this is as a result of the fact that all EU member states apply a uniform or a common external tariffs to goods originating, originating from outside the EU. Now, this doesn't mean that the tariff, which is on average 4.3%, is the same for all different types of goods. Rather, for one type of good, it might be 2%, and for another type of good, it might be 80%. What it does mean, however, is that for the exact good in question, so if it's cars, for example, all 27 remaining EU member states will all impose the exact same tariff for that individual good. So for cars, it's often quoted that the tariff rate is 80%. So all the other 27 EU member states will make 
uh, Britain pay 80% to tariffs when importing cars into the EU. Now, what is the single market? The single market is like the customs union plus. It's a more ambitious free trade area. What do I mean by that? Well, it sort of takes the customs union as the base of the cake and adds more cream on top. It adds the layers of free movement of services. Um, so things like, uh, in our case, for educational suppliers, software services, uh, e-learning, cross-border supply, which happens through the internet, the free movement of capital, uh, so money, and the free movement of people, which allows your workers to go abroad and work in other EU member states without needing a work permit. And the single market also brings in uh, a number of regulations to ensure that the 28 EU member states' uh, goods uh, and services all act on a level playing field. So if uh, there's a famous case a few years ago when, when Britain tried to uh, impose taxes on French wine and the European Court of Justice said, uh, no, you can't do that because what happens then is that it will lead in, into an increase in sales of UK beer. And that wouldn't be fair because you'd be disadvantaging, disadvantaging uh, a similar product to yours just for the benefit of your national suppliers. So let's look at the impact of how Brexit could have. Let's have a look at the impact Brexit could have on the movement of goods. To continue, to continue trading in the EU after Brexit, all UK businesses will need to have a, an EURI number as an Economic Operator Registration Identification number. Without an EORI number, you won't be able to export into the Union. Now, if you're a VAT registered business, you'll already, you'll, you'll already have been granted with an EORI number automatically. Businesses not registered, uh, who, businesses who are below the VAT threshold will need to apply for an EORI number themselves. And you can do so by logging on to www.gov.uk forward slash EORI or EORI. Now, there's a third category, which I've had a lot of contacts about, which are companies who are VAT registered, but have been confused because they haven't actually been received any URI number through the posts in recent weeks. Well, the most common resolution to this problem is to ask yourself, prior to Brexit, or prior to all this sort of Brexit uh, news, have you traded outside of the EU? Have you delivered goods or services to countries outside of the EU? Because if you have, you already have been required to have an EORI number, which means that maybe two years ago, you filled out a customs declaration form and were granted an EORI number. So the best thing to do is to check with members of your commercial sales team that you haven't already had an EORI number from a few years ago. Another important uh, thing that uh, businesses can do to uh, minimize or mitigate the effects of, a, of Brexit is to register for Transitional Simplified Procedures, or TSPs. This will stop you from when you're making imports, uh, so from when you're importing goods from the EU to the UK. Transitional Simplified Procedures will prevent you from having to undergo lengthy declarations and costly customs checks at the UK border. And so the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy highly recommends that you register for them. A TSP reduces the amount of information that importers from the EU need to give on a declaration when goods cross the border. It allows them to defer giving a full declaration until after the goods cross the border and lets them pay any duty up to a month after the import. For SMEs who often have day-to-day -day cash flows problems, which is common because on average it takes uh, customers 71 days to uh, pay uh, SMEs, as opposed to just 30 days for customers to pay larger businesses, uh, the use of TSPs could help you with daily cash flow issues. You can register for a TSP online. Now let's have a look at an overview of the import tariffs. As I mentioned earlier, UK businesses trading into the EU will now pay tariffs on exports. These tariffs will be applied on 90% of UK exports. That's the bad news. The good news is that the UK has committed to ensuring that 86% of goods imported into the UK will be tariff free. In March this year, Her Majesty's Treasury, Treasury published the tariff rates it will apply to different categories of goods imported into the UK after Brexit. Uh, 
So these are the goods that will be imported into the UK after Brexit and the tariffs that could be applied to them. You can search these tariffs using the government's online trade tariff search tool. So if you just type into Google trade tariff search tool, you'll see examples, you'll see, you can find a tariff that relates to you. Let's look at some of the tariffs that could in impact uh, ed uh, educational suppliers. So for paper, the tariff is going to be 0%, which is good news for publishers. For hardware, such as computers and laptops, it's also, it also looks like it's going to be 0%. For stationery, it could be up to 2.7%. And for textiles, it is suggested that it will be, be, that it will be between 3.5 to 12%, depending on the exact textile. There's also a suggestion that for wood, it will be 3.8%. These are all the average figures that the tariff will be for the overall category of good. But as you know, um, for example, if the average for wood is 3.8%, if you look into the tariff specification, you'll see that there's hundreds of different types of wood and each of them has their individual tariff. They might be lower than the average or higher than the average. So you'll need to check online. Do take the time to look up your specific goods because the tariffs for different items within categories can therefore vary a lot. Companies that rely on cross-border supply chains, I'm now talking to you. This is because you risk substantial cost increases because of these import tariffs. If you think of the fact that in when you're manufacturing process, you might bring in lots of components from across the EU. Each time one of these goods crosses from the EU into the UK or likewise into the EU, uh, UK into the EU and back, they'll face these tariffs. According to the Confederation for British Industry, which is the, the leading sort of think tank for business, costs for companies who rely on cross-border supply chains in the EU could triple. The costs of these supply chains could triple. The Chartered Institute for Procurement Service, Services has similarly reported that 32% of British businesses are now looking for uh, replacements to their EU supply chains. Now let's look at an overview of the export tariffs that manufacturers of goods will face. In terms of exports, the tariffs that British businesses will face are, will be set by the European Union. And these will be set by the European Union in accordance with the, uh, the tariff data or the tariff entries that they put in their WTO database. So the EU has made commitments under WTO under different kinds of products and it said these are the tariffs that we will make uh, non-EU countries pay when they import these goods into our countries. So in terms of exports, educational suppliers will be subject to the integrated tariff of the European Union, which it has registered with the WTO. This integrated tariff is called TARIC, T-A-R-I-C. Now, what's important uh, when you're trying to look up your uh, tar export tariffs for goods or face, is to search the tariff database online. So what you have to do is type in TARIC or T-A-R-I-C database online into Google and you'll find it. The EU applies the TARIC database to all third party countries. And as I mentioned earlier, it averages 4.3%. Uh, Here are a few examples that relate to educational suppliers. Paper could be charged between zero to 6.5%, depending on the type of paper. Hardware might be charged up to 1.5%, stationery at 3.7%, and textiles could be charged between 6.5 to 12%. I'd now like to uh, turn to something that will apply to um, both goods and service providers, and that's currency volatility, currency volatility. During this turbulent time for Britain, a significant risk is posed by currency volatility. Due to the weakening pound, 60% of businesses that use EU suppliers have reported that their supply chains are more expensive. Businesses can protect themselves against a further fall in the pound by contracting in sterling rather than euros when purchasing goods. So why should you contract in sterling rather than euros when contracting for goods now? The first is this. It protects you against an unexpected price rise caused by a further fall in the pound in a time between agreeing a contract and actually having to pay under the contract. 
So if you think if you agree something that costs, if you agree uh, in a contract to pay 120 euros uh, in three months' time, 120 euros might cost you a lot more pounds in three months' time than it did th the uh, three months previous years to that. And that's because the uh, pound will have devalued. The second is that contracting in sterling will help you avoid the risk of increased costs and slower processing times. This is because um, when Britain is no longer part of the EU, it will no longer be part of the what's called the Euro Transaction Payments uh, Authority. And this is the area that sort of seamlessly um, processes transactions that happen in euros. And so you could have delays or increased costs because of that. Delays at the border. Delays at the UK border are expected to be huge. Research by Imperial College London found that two minutes spent by every vehicle at a customs port could more than triple queues on adjacent motorways for up to 29 miles. 38% of UK businesses' European customers have already switched to an EU supplier, and a further 60% of European businesses say they plan to abandon UK suppliers if delays at the border extend to two to three weeks. So if your supply chain is based in the EU, it is worth seriously considering bringing it within the UK. If that's not an option, to mitigate the prospect of lengthy border delays, you could engage the services of a customs broker, a freight forwarder, or a logistics planner. According to the CBI, 45% of British businesses plan to or, or already have engaged these services. Trading goods with the rest of the world. And finally, what about everyone else for manufacturers of goods? How will the UK's trade with the rest of the world be affected by Brexit? Well, as a member of the EU, the, e the UK currently benefits from free trade agreements or economic partnerships that the EU has agreed with 88 uh, other countries. These allow UK exporters to benefit from tariff-free trade or market access to these 88 countries. And together, these EU agreements account for 14 to 15% of the UK's value in trading goods. In theory, after October, uh, after January the 31st, uh, the UK will no longer be a party to these agreements. Because once we've left the EU, we no longer benefit from the 88 free trade agreements that have been negotiated between the EU and other countries, because we're not part of the EU. However, the UK has signed on roll-on, what's called roll-on or continuity agreements uh, with many of these third-party countries, which would mean that simply they've copied and pasted the terms of the EU agreement into a separate UK uh, and country-specific uh, free trade agreement. Now, of the 88 countries, uh, that the EU, has, the EU has agreements with, the UK has signed continuity agreements with 38 of these. Crucially for educational suppliers, such continuity agreements have already been completed with markets including South Korea, Israel and Switzerland. For countries where no roll-on or continuity agreements exist, it is expected that the UK will trade according to the WTO's terms on trading goods. These terms would be governed by the WTO's General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which is called GATT. You can consult the WTO's tariff rates for different categories of good. You can consult the WTO's tariff rates for different category, categories of goods on, uh, online by accessing its tariff analysis facility. So what are the takeaways? That's everything concerning the movement of goods. Let's quickly summarise the key takeaways. After Brexit, the movement of goods will be governed by the WTO's General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT for short. Under GATT, the UK will be subject to tariffs when trading goods in and out of the EU. Different categories of goods face different tariffs. To view the tariffs your business will face, search for the online Trade Tariff Search Tool. You will need a URI number an economic operator registra registration identification number to continue trading into the EU. This is essential. Without it, you won't be able to export to the Union 
VAT registered businesses will automatically be issued with one. Another recommendation, as we said, is to register for transitional simplified procedures to save time and costly customs checks at the border. Thirdly, you can use customs broker, freight forwarders, or logistics planners to combat delays at the UK border when importing goods. You should also consider bringing your supply chain within the UK. And lastly, maybe consider contract in sterling rather than euros when trading with an EU company. It will protect you against any falls in the pound during this volatile time for the British economy. Let's now move on to the movement of services after Brexit. The UK services sector is often described as the great British success story. It accounts for nearly 80% of the UK's GDP. The value of British exports of goods and services reached 1.9 billion this year, and growth in the education services sector is now bigger than in, any, in, than in other major industries, including insurance. It's clear that the educational market is going to play a vital role in the post-Brexit economy. But how do we define an educational service? According to the formal definition provided in international law, educational services involve all trade where education and training services are provided across borders on a contract or for a fee. So to give you examples, these include online assessment and e-learning platforms, SIMS, school information management systems, and can and continued professional training services provided by UK educational suppliers abroad to CPD. They also relate to any training services that an educational supplier provides as part, as part of the delivery, the maintenance or installation of a good or software. EU law gives UK services firms preferential access rights and protections in other EU member states. This makes it easier for businesses to establish themselves abroad and to provide cross-border services. It saves firms from having to create a subsidiary, which is registered in the national law of a target EU market, or work with a European agent in order to sell their services abroad. And it's on that note that a lot of large service companies have decided precisely to create a European subsidiary registered in countries like Germany or Belgium or France, in order so that they'll continue to have the same market access that they would have had previous to Brexit. Under EU law, the freedom to provide services also includes the right of free travel, to provide and receive services, as well as the right to provide services across borders digitally. UK form firms are also protected by the rules of the single market, competition law and state aid. The EU's free trade agreements with other nations keep many markets around the world open to UK service providers. This access stops after Brexit. But if this all sounds really uh, apocalyptic, luckily for educational suppliers, this is less relevant to us because the European Union has been less keen on securing preferential access to foreign markets for its educational suppliers than it has for other industries such as telecoms, transportation and legal services. BSA is currently working on a project with the Department for International Trade and the Department for Education to, uh, to account for the fact that the European Union in its 2018 trade implementation report did not list education among the 16 service sectors it would prioritise in future trade agreements. As a result, BISA is working with the Department for Education and the Department for International Trade to ensure that the UK does prioritise educational suppliers when it uh, regains competence or control over its trade policy. This means that in, when the UK negotiates future free trade agreements with third party countries, we have asked that uh, certain market access terms be included on behalf of educational suppliers. The impact of a no deal Brexit on the movement of services. Now, as I said earlier, in the event of no deal, 
educational suppliers who trade in services will have their trade governed by the World Trade Organization's General Agreement on Trade and Services, or GATS for short. Trading services under GATS. Under GATS, the average tariffs on services are 40%, which could have a huge impact on the future international trade for educational suppliers. Before we look at how education fits within these tariffs, and I'm going to tell you that don't worry, you will not face tariffs of 40% as a reassuring heads up, we need to look at the structure of GATS and the components which govern its operation. GATS, GATS consists of three components. The first is it lays down a framework of rules that lay out the general obligation governing trade and services. So these apply to all sectors and all countries. So it's a combination of top down and bottom up approaches, because what we then have are annexes on specific service sectors and a final component, which consists of the schedules that detail each country's commitments under that sector. So to repeat, the three components are the first layer, a set of general principles, which are quite vague. The second is a set of specific service sectors. So in, for our purposes, we're interested in what's called chapter five GATS, which applies to education. And in a third layer, which is uh, almost like an Excel spreadsheet, which says what each country's commitments are under these different service sectors. So for us, it's almost like what we do is we go into an Excel spreadsheet, we find where chapter five on education services is, and then we, identify, we look through each country and see what, what commitments they have made. So as I said, GATS is therefore a combination of top-down and bottom-up approaches. There are general principles, but beyond that, countries are free to opt in or to opt out. Now GATS has four modes of trade. Um, I'm gonna focus on two of these because I think they're the most relevant to educational suppliers. Now you may be slightly confused because this looks a bit nonsensical. Why split trade up into four modes? Well, the WTO's rationale is that trade takes a number of different forms and countries may be more or less comfortable with different things. So for example, mode one compares cross-border supply. What this means is it includes all services that are transferred through things like the international postal service, as well as now the internet and e-learning, as well as teleconference facilities. So it's all services that cross the border really without there being much uh, physical contact. There's uh, a letter sort of goes through the postal service, it goes across the border, uh, a product will, or service will go across the internet. And so these are sort of products that go seamlessly across. Mode two is consumption abroad. Now this is less relevant to educational suppliers and more relevant to universities because what it mainly means is that the person is consuming the service abroad, i.e. in education context, this usually applies to students who are studying abroad. So we can ignore mode two for the large part. Mode three is commercial presence. Now what that refers to principally is where uh, a country will require you to set up a, an office in their country in order to trade there. Or maybe you want to set up an office in a country, you might want to have a China, China office if you're a large multinational. Um, or a country might say, for publishers especially, well, if we're going to distribute your textbooks here, you need to have a local partner. And mode four is a bit like the free movement, free movement of people. It's about whether uh, workers can enter in and out of countries. And it's called natural persons because in law, legal persons include people like companies. So a natural person is a human being. Under GATS, there are five categories of education service in addition to this. Uh, these are really relatively simple. Uh, these are primary, secondary, uh, tertiary, so university, adult education and a category called other in which they loop in everything else uh, from educational services that include sport to educational services that are provided for uh, people who uh, suffer from conditions under the Equality Act like disability. Now the headline is that unfortunately for us relatively few WTO members have made commitments to open up their markets when it comes to education. 
The World Bank has shown that 72% of all countries either refuse to allow market access or put uh, conditions on market access for foreign educational suppliers who want to sell to their primary, secondary, or adult education markets. This means that of the, of the 163 WTO members, only 44 have made commitments to liberalize market access. So if you're a primary education service provider, what does this mean? Well, of the 44 countries that have made a commitment under WTO's rules in educational services, only 30 have made commitments in primary education services. Now, you might be thinking, does that mean I can only sell to 30 countries? No, it doesn't. What it means is that only 30 countries have agreed formally under WTO rules to provide a guarantee that they will 100% allow market access. There'll be lots of countries who don't agree under WTO rules to provide uh, access, but what they do is instead is that they provide access under some national rules. So for example, uh, we can look at India. India doesn't provide access under WTO rules, but under its national rules, it says that in certain very uh, restricted circumstances, it will allow primary education circumstances, uh, primary education services to be sold into their country. So these 30 commitments that have been made in primary education services are the only countries where you're guaranteed that you can trade without any regulatory barriers. So there will be no barriers that will say you can trade under these conditions. Of these 30 commitments, 15 provide for tariff-free access for mode one forms of trade, so cross-border supplies. So this means that there's only 15 countries in the world where you're guaranteed access to sell services across the internet into the primary education market. So as I said, in practice, there'll be a lot more, just you'll probably face some kind of restrictions. For secondary education, it's a similar story, only 35 countries. And uh, of these uh, 35 countries, 60%, uh, so around 20, have made uh, commitments to provide tariff-free market access uh, for internet education, uh, for internet services provided over the internet or across borders. As with primary education, most of these commitments are restricted to only allowing market access to private secondary schools. Adult education has 32 country commitments. And that brings us to the end of this section. Here's a quick summary of the key information on the movement of services. After Brexit, businesses that trade in services will be governed by the WTO's General Agreement on Trade and Services, or GATS. Though, there's an, though the average tariff for GATS is 40%, for educational suppliers, the average tariff is closer to 0%. But what really matters for us is not the tariffs we face, but the non, what's called the non-tariff barriers. This is because a non-tariff barrier actually costs a lot more to suppliers than formal tariff barriers. Non-tariff barriers such as uh, requirements that you set up a local subsidiary, that you enter into a joint economic venture, or that you host a server inside a country actually end up costing you a lot more in the long term than a tariff. GATS allows individual countries to choose the degree to which they liberalize. This means that we've actually currently got a slightly distorted geographical map in terms of countries that have made commitments. The majority of countries that have made commitments are in Southeast Asia. Therefore, it might be worth considering a short-term pivot to Southeast Asia. The movement of data after Brexit. As I mentioned at the start of this presentation, the European Union is said to be based on the four freedoms, the free movement of goods, services, capital, and people. The free movement of data is now commonly referred to as the fifth freedom, however. So because we all use the internet so much, data is now seen as what's called the fifth freedom because it moves very freely across borders. Europe has recognized privacy as a human right for a long time, 
its commitment to privacy extends to include communications, reputation, and data processing. Just like the other four freedoms, the free movement of data requires rules and regulations. In 2018, the EU's General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, came into force. So in 2018, GDPR came into force. GDPR presumes that personal data is really important and therefore every aspect of interacting with data requires careful planning. Although GDPR is a European provision, it is currently directly effective in UK law because it's a regulation. Under EU law, when something is a regulation, that's a piece of European legislation that all member states are obliged to impose in their national law. So what means what happens right now is by very fact of the by mere fact of the UK's membership of the EU, the GDPR continues to apply to it. So at the very least, if you're thinking, when will the GDPR continue to apply to, the GDPR will at the very least continue to apply to the 11 o'clock on the 31st of January 2020. And if a transition deal is agreed, uh, meaning that Boris Johnson's withdrawal agreement is passed by Parliament, then the GDPR's provisions will continue to apply to us until 11 o'clock on the 31st of December 2020. So what are the implications for GDPR and for the movement of data when Britain leaves the EU? Let's begin by looking at international transfers of data, which is key for educational suppliers. The GDPR restricts the transfer of personal data to countries outside the European Economic Area. Now, the European Economic Area is something that's slightly different to the European Union. But you can think of it as this. All you need to do to think of who are the members of the European, European Economic Area are to take the current 28 EU member states and add three countries, which are Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein. So the GDPR restricts the transfer of personal data to countries outside the European Economic Area where the recipient of the data is a separate organization or individual. Now, what does this mean? The UK won't be a member of the European Economic Area after Brexit, meaning transfers of personal data from organizations within the EU to other organizations in the UK face being restricted, unless the EU is satisfied that the UK has implemented adequate data protection legislation. This change could be hugely significant for educational suppliers, particularly ed tech companies, businesses with e-learning products, and school information management systems that handle large amounts of personal data across a number of countries. They will have to adapt new compliance measures, which I'll now go through now. To reiterate, once the, EU, once the UK has left the European Economic Area, which will, it will leave by default of leaving the European Union, GDPR would only restrict the transfer of personal data from the EEA to the UK if the recipient of the data is a separate organization or individual. Now, I highlighted the word separate. This is all a lot of legal terminology, so what in practice does it mean? Uh, let's think of it this way. If your business has two offices and it's not a different subsidiary or parent office, so if your business has two offices, the same company, one in the UK and the other in the UK, so one in the EU and one in the other in the UK, you don't need to worry. So I'll start again. If your business has two offices, one in the EU and the other in the UK, you don't need to worry. Transferring personal data from the former to the latter will not be subject to restrictions as the transfer would not take place with a separate organization. It would be a transfer within the same organization. As long as that other office in the UK or in the EU was part of the same company and wasn't a different parent or subsidiary company or a different company altogether, this would not be a transfer to a separate organization. It would be a transfer within an organization. However, transfers to another company within the same corporate group will be restricted. If your EU parent or subsidiary 
transferred personal data to your UK company because in legal terms, they're different companies, even if they are in a parent subsidiary relationship, it would be a restricted transfer because it would take place between separate companies. Restrictions on the movement of data will only apply to what are called transfers of data and not mere flows. Again, this is an important legal distinction. A transfer of data is where there is an intention to access or manipulate the personal data in the non-EU country, i.e. the UK. But if data merely flows through a server in the UK and to another country, this is not a transfer of data, it's merely a flow of data if it's not accessed or manipulated. So let's say your main office is in London, but you also have offices in Brussels and Paris. You're a cosmopolitan company. Your Brussels office wants to send data to your Paris office, which will be routed for your company's server in London. So imagine that. Your Brussels office wants to send data to your Paris office. And because of your server hosting arrangements to send it to Paris, that data would automatically be routed for your server in London. So long as there was no intention to access or manipulate the personal data as it passed through your London server, it would not be qualified as a restricted transfer. It would be considered a direct transfer between Brussels and Paris. However, if you did anything like uh, download it or use it uh, in any profiling or used it in any way for any kind of processing of that data, uh, that would be considered a transfer of data and you would have to comply with certain GDPR precisions that I'll describe in a moment. In order for a data transfer from the EU to the UK to go ahead, the UK will require that one of four conditions is satisfied. The first is where the EU Commission grants what's called an official adequacy decision, an official adequacy decision, by which a non-European economic area country's data protection laws have been deemed sufficient to allow the unrestricted flow of data to it. Because the UK is still a member of the European economic area, it has not yet been possible for the European Commission to consider whether the UK's data protection laws are sufficient for it to be granted what's called adequacy status, because adequacy status is only granted to non-EU countries. So the UK is not currently one of the 13 countries that have been granted, granted an adequacy decision. Before adequacy is granted, the Commission will need to go through an assessment process. And despite the UK government having asked for this to start already, the Commission has said it will not begin until the UK has left the EU. It is uncertain whether the UK, in the short term at least, Will be, awarded an ad, will be awarded adequacy status. An adequacy status essentially means that business could continue as normal as, as it is now. The reason for this is that if the UK's Data Protection Act 2018 incorporates the GDPR into UK law, the European Court of Justice has previously expressed reservations over Britain's Investigatory Powers Act 2016, which is known as RIPA, which it said uh, infringes on individuals' data privacy. So let's work on the assumption that the UK is not going to get this magic carte blanche, a uh, magic wand of an adequacy decision. What will businesses therefore have to do to comply with GDPR? Well, they'll have to comply with what's called Articles 49, 46 to 49 of GDPR, which apply to non GDPR countries. These three Articles outline three ways in which British, in which uh, non-GDPR countries can comply with GDPR and therefore make restricted transfers from the EU into the UK after Brexit. The first of these is the easiest and the one that your business should probably prioritise. The easiest change UK businesses can make will be to enter into a contract incorporating one of two standard data protection clauses that have been approved by the European Commission. Now, all you have to do here is go onto the European Commission's website and copy and paste the entire uh, wording of these clauses and put them in a contract notice to your customer. If you want to uh, be forwarded to the European Commission website, uh, just send uh, me an email at alex 
So A-L-E-X at BESA, B-E-S-A dot org dot UK, and I'll forward it to you. If you're entering into a new contract or incorporating it into an old contract, you must use the standard data protection clauses in their entirety and without amendment. As long as you do this and the customer who you are, whose data you'll be handling, fills in some of the uh, information in these standard data contractual clauses and passes them back to you, you will be GDPR compliant when making transfers of data. If you're a multinational, you should consider adopting binding corporate rules. If you, are, if you sign up to this group document called Binding Corporate Rules, you can make restricted transfers. Binding Corporate Rules are internal codes of conduct operating within a multinational group, which applies to restricted transfers of personal data from your multinationals uh, companies, which are based in the European economic area, to your, your multinationals other companies, which are based outside of the European economic area. So it's kind of like an internal passport for your separate companies in your multinational to transfer with each other, despite the fact that they some are based in the EU and some are not. You must submit binding corporate rules for the approval of the European Economic Areas Supervisory Authority. And to do this, all you need to do is look up the local office of the European Union's Data Protection Board, and there's one in each of the 20 well, there's one in each of the 31 European Economic Area countries. So that's the 20 EU member states, plus Norway, Iceland, and Switzerland. The final way is to pass, is to do this between two public authorities. And this can happen so long as the contract entered, entered into is legally binding, enforceable, and contains rights or remedy for individuals whose personal data is deemed, uh, is deemed acceptable. That brings an end to BISA's Brexit seminar. We hope you have enjoyed it and found it informative. And if you have any questions, please uh, either play this video back or feel free to send me an email as alex at bisa.org.uk. Thank you and have a nice day.